Hey, what's up, everybody? Welcome to my channel. My name is Paul, the Canadian Snowman, here once again with another Geography Now video. Malaysia, I accidentally skipped over it uh, yesterday, so I'm sorry. So the order is kind of, kind of out of whack here. But anyways, we're doing you guys today. I apologize. And yeah, Malaysia, let's see what you guys have in store for me. I do know where you guys are located and stuff like that but uh don't really know don't know much else really so uh i guess let's jump into it please hit that like and subscribe guys below and uh hopefully we'll have a lot of fun with this video find out some maybe some cool new stuff interesting stuff anyways do it dun, 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 three two one bam since I made the Indonesia episode, you have no idea how many Malaysians were like, Okay, now that you did our cousins episode, do not mess with ours. Oh, don't worry, Malaysia. And here to reassure you, I made you some nasi goreng. It's, it's time to learn geography. No! Hey everybody, I'm your host Barbs. How refreshing! We are back in Southeast Asia, and today, after Brunei, East Timor, Indonesia, we are doing the last country in the Nusantara Archipelago, Malaysia. Ahem. Oh, sorry, didn't see you there, Singapore. You're so small. So, what do the Malaysians <laughs> bring to the table that the others don't? Well, let's find out in the first segment. Q transition. Now this is gonna be really fun because Malaysia's land has so many unique twists and turns and explaining it, it you know, it's kind of like doing a Rubik's Cube blindfolded. Right, Ken? Right, totally. Yeah. yeah. Uh you got it? I don't know, did I? You got it. First of all, Malaysia is located in Southeast Asia, divided into two main parts, Peninsular Malaysia, where about 40% of the land, which also has the southernmost tip of mainland Asia, Tanjung Piai, while East Malaysia, or Malaysian Borneo, takes up about 60% of the country's land on the island of Borneo, making it one of the only two islands shared by three nations along with Cyprus. If you want to be technical, Cyprus kind of has four, including the UN buffer zone, but you get the point. Just Oh yeah, I remember you doing one of the other countries and they, they mentioned something like that. Some Malaysia's got basically, wow, got land on two different, you know, land that separate. I wonder how that kind of works out, you know? You're trying to, like, you know, I guess meet and uh, explore, I guess, you know, the other part of the country that's not connected. I guess you guys take a ferry or something. I don't know. <laughs> uh, doo -doo -doo, three, two, one, bam. Just watch the Cyprus episode. Keep in mind, about 80% of the population lives on the peninsula, while only about 20% live on Malaysian Borneo. In addition, the country has over 870 islands off its shores, the state of Sabah having the most with nearly 400, the largest one being Bangi Island. However, the island of Sebatik is a little bigger, but the island is split in half with Indonesia in the south. Also, they have a little bit of a dispute with the Philippines in the east. The country is divided into 13 states and three federal territories, Putrajaya Labuan, with the capital Kuala Lumpur. However, Due to overcrowding, almost all the government ministries and administrative offices were moved to Putrajaya in 1999. After Kuala Lumpur, the next largest cities are Georgetown wow. on Penang Island and Ipoh. The busiest airports are. Hold on a second. Yeah, that wasn't that tower. There was a movie uh, with that tower. I forget what the movie is called. It was. Uh, there was a, some kind of like heist, right? Anyways, but that those towers definitely look familiar from like. Some kind of like James Bond kind of movie, not not the James Bond movie, but the actor that plays used to play James Bond. Never mind, never mind. I'm sorry. <laughs> Kuala Lumpur, the next largest cities are Georgetown on Penang Island and Ipoh. The busiest airports are Kuala Lumpur International, Kota Kinabalu, and Penang Internationals. Now here's the thing, Malaysia lies under the South China Sea. If you don't know anything about this place and if you didn't watch the Brunei episode, it basically goes like this. <laughs> basically, every country in this area wants a piece of these things called the Spratly Islands. Today, Malaysia has claim to about 11 of them and the most notable one being Layang Layang, which they built an airbase on. Now you wow. might notice that it's interesting how these two small entities, Singapore and Brunei, got mixed up into this whole region. Well, when it came to Brunei, it kind of went down like this. Welcome to the Malaysia Agreement. Sultans, please sign the paper saying you'd like to be part of Malaysia. Wait, I'd have to give up that? And, and I'd have to lose control of what? Oh, hell no. As for Singapore, it was more like, Hey, Malaysia, you just got free from British rule. Let's join up. Makes sense? Yeah, we are now one country. Yeah. You have too many Chinese people, and you're gonna waste my money! Yeah, well you only get privileges to the Malay! Uh, you know what, you're 
the club. Yeah, fine, you know, whatever. I quit. One day, you know what? I'm gonna make something of myself! Okay! <laughs> and boy howdy, did they keep that promise. Otherwise, some notable places of interest might include places like the largest roundabout in the world, the Petrolis wow. Towers, the tallest twin buildings in the world, Kuala Lumpur Tower, the Batu Caves with a Hindu shrine, the National Monument of Malaysia, Legoland Malaysia. What? Yep, they have one. Sunway Lagoon, the National Mosque of Malaysia. My God, I already want to go to Malaysia, man. I'm just like, I'm just getting into this video. I want to go to like land. That seems like a lot of fun. I'm a kid at heart. I can't help it. Malaysia, Legoland, Malaysia. Yep, they have one. Sunway Lagoon, the National Mosque of Malaysia. Kek Luk Si Buddhist Temple. These palaces, the old Dutch buildings of Malacca, the Leaning Tower of Taluk Intan, Afamosa Fortress, the Cat Statue of Kuching, this Heritage Museum, Sarawak Cultural Villages, and the Sepilak Orangutan Rehabilitation Center. What? Yep, orangutans, they have plenty of those in here. Which means we can now swing over to the next segment, the... When it comes to Malaysia's land, they got kind of lucky because not only is it like rich and beautiful, but unlike their neighbors, mm. you don't really have to deal with any crazy catastrophes. First of all, Malaysia rests comfortably on the bottom of the Eurasian plate, literally shielded on all sides, mostly by Indonesia and the Philippines. This means that if any earthquakes occur, Indonesia usually absorbs all of it. If cyclones and tropical storms attack, the Philippines and Indonesia take the hit. And if a volcano erupts, they don't have to worry because they don't really have any volcanoes and it's probably happening in Indonesia. Wow. Thanks, Indonesia. <laughs> now, when it comes to nature, even though the largest lake, the Kenya Reservoir, lies on the West Peninsula. All right, another awesome thing about going there. You ain't got to worry about no natural catastrophes, disasters. So, you guys are jumping up. Just, Malaysia just kicking butt already, man. Now, when it comes to nature, even though the largest lake, the Kenya Reservoir, lies on the West Peninsular Malaysia side, the Eastern Malaysia Borneo side has all the extremes. They have the highest mountain, Mount Kinabalu, the longest river, the Rajang, and a lot more animals. In fact, Malaysia is one of the most biodiverse countries in the world. They have 14,500 species of flowering plants and trees, over 600 bird species, over 200 species of mammals. Speaking of which, Peninsular Malaysia is home to the most black panthers in the world. Insert Wakanda joke, I don't have time. Speaking of that, the national animal is the Malaysian tiger which is also featured on the coat of arms which we will cover in flag friday stay tuned otherwise they have elephants rhinos orangutans and they even have their own version of tapirs like the ones in south america wow and that creepy looking proboscis monkey many of these <laughs> species you can find in one of the oldest rainforests in the world over three times older than the amazon taman nagara malaysia is also a land of caves in fact they have the largest chamber in the world that can be found in sarawak otherwise malaysia is known for producing electronics palm oil petroleum gas and rubber they're actually the second largest palm oil producer in the world and the largest condom maker just saying they even have their own <laughs> national car company proton making malaysia the 11th country in the world with the capability to fully design and engineer and manufacture cars otherwise some national dishes might include things like nasi kandar nasi dadang nasi kerabu chicken perchik mangosteen and durian are treasured fruits and the national dish nasi lemak oh and if you have the chance see if you can witness the famous tarik tea shows the servers pour out tea sometimes what? over a meter in length it's almost seen as like an art form Okay, I think that's just about it for now in this segment. Uh, yeah. Let's talk about the coolest part of Malaysia, the Malaysians. Alan. Just for the record, the word Malay refers to the races that make up Malaysia. Malayan is the geographic term for peoples of West Malaysia on the peninsula and not part of Borneo. And Malaysian is the nationality and citizenship. So a Malay person in Singapore is Malay, but not Malaysian. And a citizen of Indian descent living in Kuala Lumpur would be a Malaysian and Malayan, but not Malay. Got it? Huh. Probably not. First of all, the country has about no, 32 million people and is one of the fastest growing nations in Asia. The country is made up of 67% Malay or Bumiputra indigenous Malay peoples. We'll talk more about that in a bit. About a quarter of the population is Chinese, about 7% are Indians, and the rest are other groups mixed in, including a few other Asian groups and Europeans. They use the Malaysian ringgit as their currency, they use the type G and M plug outlets, and they drive on the left side of the road. Now, here's the thing. Let's talk politics. Oh! No, we're not getting into an ideological debate. We're just gonna explain the system in which Malaysia's government operates. Proceed. Malaysia is one of the few monarchies in the world. However, it's not a monarchy in the conventional sense because they kind of have nine kings 
ish. These nine states each have a royal leader known as a sultan, and every five years they rotate to allow one of the nine sultans to rule as head king, known as the Yangti Putuang Agong. That means that technically, if you were a boy and your dad just finished being king for his five year term, you could be the next one, but you would have to wait at least 40 years for it to happen. You know, since wow. eight other kings would have to be king before you. Yeah, I know, it's like, oh, what the? There's a lot more that goes into it, but that's kind of like the basic underline. They are the only country that does this. I mean, the closest thing would be maybe the Comoros with that rotating president thing, but it's nowhere. That's interesting, though. I guess you never, I mean, you get, that means there's no voting, right? Everyone's got their own, like, king, and you kind of, I guess your area would suck if you had to wait, like, 40 years for your area to get, like, represented, you know, for, I guess, laws that you might want to get passed. But very interesting, though. Do -do -do near as complex as this. Nonetheless, the royals are held under a constitution that limits their power mostly to cultural and religious affairs as well as appointing certain leaders and so on. Most of the government activity is held and controlled by the prime minister and the parliament. Which brings us to the most recent controversy, the 2018 election. This effectively changed everything as for the first time since 1957, the BN party was voted out and the new PKR party took over. And it was- Okay, well, yeah. They, they, they said before, I mean, they don't have full power. So, you know, if there's still there's still elections and stuff like that, you know, they just they have they just have some power, not all the power. So that's cool though. Controversy in elections or politics. Hmm. Nothing new, nothing new. <laughs> First time since 1957, the BN party was voted out and the new PKR party took over. And it was actually a peaceful transition. We really don't have a lot of time to talk nice. about it, but it's really interesting to look into and talk to a Malaysian person if you want to know more about it. It was like a huge deal for the country. Anyway, the country has two official recognized languages, Malay and English. They were once a British nice. territory, so it kind of makes sense. It's taught from elementary school. Malay is basically intelligible to Indonesian. Both countries can generally understand each other. I explained this a bit in the Indonesia episode. For Malay, the words are easy to read, but the problem is the intonation. For example, the word for slowly, I believe, is perlahan, not perlahan. It's like you just you have to know how these things work. Nonetheless, about half of the population is mostly fluent in three languages, adding their mother tongue, especially if they're part of the Chinese and Indian minority groups. And they are allowed to take vernacular schools that teach in these languages, just like Singapore. Which brings to culture. In Malaysia, the population is quite diverse. You have a lot of Chinese known as the Peranakan Chinese that have existed there since the 15th century. They have a unique Chinese Malay culture with a touch of European influence. The Indian community is mostly Tamil and Telugu speaking South Dravidian Indian groups that were brought over during the the British colonial years. Hmm. Then of course you have the largest people group, the ethnic Malays or the Bumiputra, as well as the Orang Asal, whom are like the really indigenous ethnic Malays that make up the majority of the population in East Malaysia on Borneo. Sometimes these two people groups are collectively joined together under the term Malay, although some might disagree. But either way, these two groups kind of steer the direction in terms of what constitutes Malay culture. Oh, and don't even get okay. started on the Bajau people that live on these structures in the middle of the ocean for most of their lives and they've adapted to hold their breath for like 15 minutes underwater. Yeah, what? those people are cool. Another thing I really want to highlight is that sometimes Indonesians do kind of accuse Malay. And they need to go even more on that, man. The guys who live on the, in the middle of the ocean. On the middle of the ocean, but that's some pretty interesting stuff there. But, I mean, don't you guys want to explore more and not stay in your little huts on the, on the water? I'm sure you guys do. You go on the mainland and stuff, but. Oh, you guys ain't got no, like, tsunamis or you ain't got no hurricanes. You ain't got to worry about nothing. Your house is probably be pretty good, pretty safe there, right? Yeah, those people are cool. Another thing I really want to highlight is that sometimes Indonesians do kind of accuse Malaysians of stealing their culture because a lot of Malaysians are descended from Sumatra. Faith-wise, Malaysia is also quite diverse. Although the country's official religion is Islam, it's a multi-confessional nation. Buddhists are mostly from the Chinese community, Hindus for the Indians, Christians from all races. Numerous temples, mosques, and shrines and churches are found all over. Malay culture is defined by a number of aspects. For one, the clothing. Remember a couple months ago that guy from Malaysia, Kamarul, sent me the Malay hat? the Tengolok. So I forgot to bring this on set when we were filming, but I still have the hat and I, I love it. And I told you I would wear it in the episode. So here I am, I'm wearing it in the Malaysia episode. Thank you so much, man. I asked some of you guys, the Malaysian geography peeps, what you would like me to highlight in terms of Malay culture. And some things you said included things like the performing arts, such as Joget dancing and Makyong theater, traditional shadow puppetry, Silat martial arts, Songket weaving, the traditional steep roof and sharp buttress architecture, Gamelan music. Speaking of which, 
history time. We don't have enough time to go too far into it, but in the quickest way I can put it, Hindu kingdoms, Buddhist kingdoms, Islamic Sultanate, Portuguese came in, Dutch came in, British came in and made the White Raja period, which made things interesting. World War II, Japanese came in, British came in again, independence. Okay, very quickly just to cut, this is the part where I totally forgot to mention all the cool stuff that happened in the 60s. It's how they got those two states in Borneo. We'll explain more on Flag slash Fan Friday, so stay tuned. Economic restructuring and industry boom, 2018 vote for the new prime minister, and here we are today. All right, some notable people that you guys, the Malaysian geography people, suggested that I should mention in this video might include people like Siti Nuraliza, Lat, the cartoonist, Sheikh Muzaffar Shukor, P. Ramli, Ziavi, Hang Tua, Enrique of Malacca, Michelle Yo, Tony Fernandez, Air Asia owner, designer Jimmy Chu, Melinda Louie, singer Yuna, director James Wan, Dr. Mahathir Mohamed, Nicole Ann David, Lee Chong Wei, Henry Golding, and the first prime minister, Tunku Abdul Rahman. Okay. I'm sure there's way more famous people I could have mentioned, but I'm sure there's more famous people. Like usually when they go through famous people, oh, most of the time, I don't know any of them. I actually recognize a couple of those names, so good job, Malaysia. We got to move on. Time to go to the last part of this episode, the... Now, Malaysia is quite the powerhouse player when it comes to Southeast Asia. They got a good thing going on and they host great parties. Outside of Asia, the EU has good relations, making Malaysia one of the top three trading partners of Southeast Asia. And specifically, Austria loves exchanging electronics and pharmaceuticals with them. Of course, the UK is still pretty close. As a former colony, much of the cultural residue is still evident to this day. They are one of the Commonwealth of Nations. Many Malaysians live in the UK and most of the white population in Malaysia are of British descent. As a member of the Association of Southeast Asian nations. Of course, they have close ties to their neighbors. Cambodians love Malaysia and visit often, whereas Malaysia is one of the closest and biggest investors of Cambodia. Thailand has a few issues since there are those Malay Patani separatists in the south that keep protesting, whereas the Philippines is like, hmm, we're really similar ethnically, but you're mostly Muslim and I'm mostly Catholic, but whatever, we both like coffee and fried chicken. When it comes to their best friends, however, most Malaysians I've talked to have said Indonesia and Singapore. Singapore uh -huh. may have left the Malaysian Union, but they still kept close ties as a sovereign state. They are quite cooperative in business and even culturally, they are very similar with noticeable Chinese and Indian minority enclaves. Indonesia is like the big brother that has a very different political system, but in the end, they cannot deny how alike they are. The biggest difference would be that most Indonesians have a Javanese background, whereas the Malaysians are just Malay, mostly Sumatran, but they talk the same, they eat the same, they enjoy the same hot, humid atmosphere, and they have close relations altogether. In conclusion, with sultans, kings, tigers, panthers, temples, shrines, mosques, and really cool hats, it's no wonder why Malaysia is becoming a hot spot that everyone's talking about today. Stay tuned. The Maldives is coming up next. Yeah, I, I've wanted to. I've heard a couple of those things before. I mean, it's definitely I, I, like I knew they speak uh, English. You know, there was um, you know, a part of the way in language they speak because I knew they were part of like the Commonwealth. And yeah, definitely would be interesting to go visit there. Uh, well, I always want to go to like you know like, these interesting countries and I go to like you know, a bar or, you know, like a, you know, restaurant or like a guess, club or whatever you go to, you know, kind of like hang out over there and just kind of mingle with people, you know, it'd be cool just to, you know, have fun and hang out, you know, and it, a lot of awesome nature. And yeah, you guys are pretty safe there. Uh, yeah, there's a really cool, interesting country, the Black Panther. That's pretty amazing. And uh, the wildlife. Uh, yeah, just very interesting. It seemed like it was like a very chill, cool country to, uh, to live in. Anyways, but anyways, yeah, please hit that like and subscribe button below. Uh, hope you guys continue the journey. Every single country in the world, alphabetical order. Uh, sometimes uh, uh, when I don't mess up. But uh, <laughs> anyways, guys, appreciate you guys watching, and I will catch you guys in future videos. Always a blast. Peace. You guys have a great day.